Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at the three different muscle types of the body, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, and we're gonna compare and contrast each of them. Importantly, we need to begin by talking about what muscle tissue is. It's one of the four tissues of the body. We've got epithelial, we've got nervous, we've got connective, and we've got muscle tissue. And the job of muscle tissue is to perform mechanical work. It allows for us to move, whether it's to move our body consciously, whether it's to move the blood into and out of the heart, or whether it's to move various substances through our digestive tract, our renal system, or our reproductive tract. All of this occurs because of muscle and muscles are excitable tissue. This is really important for students to understand, excitable tissue. There's only a couple of different excitable tissue types in the body. You've got nervous tissue, endocrine tissue, and muscle tissue. Now, a tissue being excitable means it has the capacity to do something. It can be excited, like me. It can do nothing, but when it's excited, something happens. So nervous tissue, when nothing's happening, it doesn't fire any signals off, but it can be excited to send what we call an action potential, a signal for communication. The endocrine system, when these cells aren't doing anything, nothing's happening, but they can be excited to do something, which is to release hormones into the bloodstream. And muscle tissue, when they're not doing anything, they just sit there, but they can be excited to contract. And when muscles contract and shorten, they can help move things around. So if it's skeletal muscle, when this muscle contracts, it moves the skeleton and allows for locomotion. When cardiac muscle contracts, it decreases the volume of these little cavities inside the heart known as atria and ventricles and pushes blood around the body. And the smooth muscle that lines the inside hollow organs of our digestive tract, our renal tract, and our reproductive tract, and also our blood vessels, when they contract, they help push substances through the body. So that's really important for you to understand. Let's first begin with skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is muscle that's attached to our skeleton. And generally speaking, these muscles cross joints. For example, I've drawn up the biceps brachii. It crosses both the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. And when you excite skeletal muscle to contract, it will shorten. And if it shortens and it shortens across joints, those joints move. So contract biceps brachii, I get elbow flexion. I contract biceps brachii, I get shoulder flexion. And this is the result of skeletal muscle. Now, all skeletal muscle contracts consciously. We must write that down. So it is conscious, let's say voluntary is a better one. It's voluntary movement. Voluntary movement. Now compare that to something like cardiac, right? Do you consciously tell your heart to contract? No, thank God we don't, because imagine how much mental time and energy it would take to constantly tell our heart to beat once every second, it would be horrible. So cardiac muscle is involuntary. And like I said, you should be grateful for that. Smooth muscle, this is gonna be the muscle that lines the inside of our hollow organs. Like I said, our digestive tracts, so our esophagus, our stomach, our small, large intestines, all the way through, and our urinary tract, so our ureters, our bladder, our urethra, and our reproductive tract, and our blood vessels as well. This is all smooth muscle. Again, you don't tell this muscle to contract. So it contracts involuntarily. I'll just write involuntary like I did for the other one. So only one is voluntary contraction, that's skeletal muscle. I want you to think about what these cells look like under a microscope, because it tells you a lot about their function. So if I were to draw up skeletal muscle and see what it looks like under a microscope, what you'll find for skeletal muscle is number one, it's shaped like a cylinder. Compare that to cardiac muscle. If I were to compare cardiac muscle under a microscope, what you'll find is that it's branched. And then if I were to compare that to smooth muscle under a microscope, it has this shape to it, like a spindle shape, like an eye. All right, so that's the first thing. That's how they look under the microscope, quite different. Then nuclei, 
we must talk about their nuclei because it's very important, particularly for skeletal muscle. Now, the nuclei we know houses DNA. And if we look at skeletal muscle, you're actually going to find that it is multi nucleated, multi nucleated. Let's write this down. Let's write down the fact that it is cylinder shaped. Let's write down the fact that cardiac is branched and write down that smooth muscle is spindle shaped. And then let's write down that skeletal muscle is multi-nucleated, has many nuclei. If we compare that to cardiac, it's uni or bi-nucleated, and it's usually found right in the center. So let's write uni or sometimes bi-nucleated. And then let's compare this to smooth muscle, which is uninucleated. Now, again, and it's sitting right in the center. What's so important about looking at the nuclei? Well, it's really important for skeletal muscle. Think why. Which of these three muscles or muscle types do you think has the capacity to grow most? Hypertrophy is the term that we use for muscle growth or tissue growth, really. It's skeletal muscle. You go to the gym, you lift weights. The whole reason why muscle grows or skeletal muscle grows is because it, you expose it to stress. And that stress is a heavy load. And that muscle goes, Phew, this is difficult. I don't want it to be this difficult next time. So I'm going to release growth factors and I'm going to stimulate the synthesis of more proteins to allow for muscle contraction to occur. We know that proteins are made from the DNA in our nuclei. DNA gets transcribed into RNA, RNA gets translated into amino acids which fold into proteins and proteins can be used for contraction and growth and that's what happens with skeletal muscle. So the more nuclei, the more capacity you have for hypertrophy and growth and that's why skeletal muscle has so many nuclei. Our heart has less of a capacity, hence why it's uni or binucleated and our smooth muscle really doesn't have the capacity for hypertrophy, hence why it's only uninucleated. Let's talk a little bit about their appearance as well because what you're going to find is down the microscope skeletal muscle has these stripes like these tiger looking stripes to it. So does cardiac. Cardiac has these stripes as well. We call these stripes striations. So let's write this down. So this is striated skeletal muscle. This is also striated. This is cardiac muscle, but smooth muscle, now this is where the name comes from, right? Skeletal muscle makes sense. It's attached to the skeleton. Cardiac muscle's easy. It lines the ventricles and atria of our heart. Smooth muscle tells you nothing about where it is, but about what it looks like. Under the microscope, smooth muscle looks smooth. It does not have those striations. So let's write this down. Let's write striations. And then let's put a cross through it. No striations. What are these striations? These striations are the protein microfilaments that allow for contraction to occur. So if I were to take either cardiac, uh, sorry, cardiac or skeletal and have a look at it in a bit more detail, it's going to look a little bit like this. You're going to have two major types of proteins. You're going to have what's called myosin. And this myosin has these little golf club looking heads to them like this. These little arms and golf club looking heads. And they need to bind to the second protein. And that second protein is called actin. So let's draw up some actin. So here's some actin. Now, we're going to have these things called Z disks over here. And what, was actually, what we've actually just drawn up here is what we call a sarcomere. So this actual thing here, called a sarcomere, is actually the smallest contractile unit of muscle. 
What happens is the mice and heads bind to the actin, they walk along it and they shorten the whole thing. That's contraction. If you shorten and, contraction, uh, shorten and contract this, you're going to shorten and contract the muscle tissue. So you've got the myosin, which is the blue. I'll write that down for you. We've got the myosin and you've got the actin. Now I was saying to you about the striations. What are the striations? Well, can you see here that you've got parts where both proteins overlap? So you've got an area here, no overlap, here overlap, no overlap, overlap, no overlap. When you look at that under a microscope, you get stripes. The areas of overlap look darker and they're the striations, which tells you that in both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, Actin and myosin are arranged in this fashion for contraction to occur. But when we look at smooth muscle, it's not arranged in this fashion. In, and the reason why is this, because they're arranged in series and parallel, right? So basically take this sarcomere and go boom, 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 and then go boom, 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 and add them in series and parallel. So they're all in the same direction. So that when they contract the whole thing, shortens, which means when skeletal muscle contracts, the whole thing shortens. When cardiac muscle contracts, the whole thing shortens. But the difference here with smooth muscle is that they're not arranged in series and parallel. They're arranged in what seems to be this mishmash different shape. And if it's arranged in this mishmash shape, you don't get these pattern striations. And why would we want our smooth muscle to be arranged in a weird way? Because we don't just want contraction of our smooth muscle to go like that. We want contraction of our smooth muscle to go in many directions. Why? Well, because smooth muscle is not just straight, like skeletal muscle, where we want it to shorten like this and bend the joint, or cardiac muscle, where we want it to shorten and contract over a ventricle, we have smooth muscle lining a tube. And so if we've got a tube like this, what you want is you want to narrow the diameter of that tube, similar to what happens here, but you also want to shorten the length of the tube. And this is how things move through. If you were to get a tennis ball and put it into a stocking and you were to squeeze that tennis ball through the stockings, what you're doing is you're narrowing the diameter but you're also shortening the tube and that's peristalsis. That's how things move through tubes. And it can only happen if the uni, uh, sorry, if the uh, smooth muscle cells have their contractile proteins arranged in what looks like a mishmash sort of random way. So hopefully that makes sense to you. So we've got voluntary for skeletal, involuntary for cardiac, involuntary for smooth. We've got multinucleated for skeletal, we've got uni or binucleated for cardiac, and we've got uninucleated for smooth. We've got uh, cylinder shaped for skeletal, branched for cardiac, and we've got spindle shaped for our smooth muscle. All right, what's the next thing we need to look at? We need to have a look at how are they connected to one another? So what you'll find here for the skeletal is that they're simply just sitting on top of each other like parallel, right? So you're gonna have, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there, right? When we look at cardiac, it's gonna be attached like this. Because it's branched, it wants to be attached to other ones like this. So you've got all these branches attached to each other. Now, why is this the case? This is important because, forget skeletal for a second, because, because it's ranged, arranged in parallel, it's like that on purpose. Take them, you're gonna have the, it arranged for the biceps, for example, these big, long cylindrical cells like this, right? Like that. I know my lines aren't very straight, but it's like that, so that when it contracts, it shortens like that, that's easy. But the branching, because it moves around these ventricles and atria, they're actually connected through little gaps called gap junctions. 
You got these intercalated discs that hold each cell together, intercalated discs. They hold each one together and then you've got these gap junctions. Let's write this down. You got intercalated discs, intercalated discs, right, which hold things together. And then you've got gap junctions, which allow for communication, talk to each other. Now, why do we want them to talk to each other? Here's the thing. You probably are aware that when a heart contracts, you don't just contract one part of the heart muscle, you contract all of the heart muscle. But the stimulus for contraction begins in one spot, the sinoatrial node. It begins at around about up here. An electrical signal gets sent in this fashion around the tissue. Now, the electrical signal needs to spread through the muscle. Now, it spreads through these gap junctions. So if you start an action potential or you know, sodium jumping into this cell, it gets to spread to this one and spreads to this one. So when that contracts, that contracts, and then that contracts. And it contracts in what we call a syncytium. It means that if you stimulate one muscle cell to contract, all the rest will contract. That's not the same here. You need a different motor neuron innovating each of these muscle cells. If I have a motor neuron coming down, it needs to innovate that one, it needs to innovate that one, it needs to innovate that one to tell it to contract. Not the case here. You only need to innovate this first one and it spreads the signal to the rest and they all act as one. When all muscle cells act as one, we call that a syncytium. Spelt that wrong. I <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't talk at the same time. Sin, sishim. Oh, I've probably spelt it wrong again. But anyway, the term is sin sishim. I promise you that. It's just that my spelling's pretty poor. And then when we've got smooth muscle, they're going to be connected as well like this. So I've got a spindle. Going to have another spindle. Going to have another spindle. Going to have another spindle. Gonna have another spindle, like that. And again, it's so they can tract in multiple directions to help move things through. All right, so these are the similarities and differences between skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle, and I hope that it helps. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you wanna contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic, at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.